Good morning. Happy New Year to you all. It's good to see familiar faces, especially on such a big day as this. I hope you all are well. I've titled this morning's message, A Church is Only as Godly as Its Leaders. A Church is Only as Godly as its leaders. Our text for this morning, and if you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open it, is from 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 3 through 7 of a familiar text, I'm sure, one that Roy and I have talked about on a number of occasions. A text that was picked for me. I haven't had a text picked for me in over 22 years in the ministry, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but we're going to read today from God's Word, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. A church is only as godly as its leaders, as is my custom, and I would invite you to do so as well as we read God's Word. If you would stand with me, I would... Greatly appreciate that. Before we do, let's ask God to bless the reading of it to us. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, this is your word, holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible. I pray our only rule of faith and practice. And as we've opened it before us this day, as we've assembled in your name, we ask that you would bless us with your spirit that you would unstop our ears, that you would remove the scales from our eyes, that you would crush our hearts of stone, that we might hear a word from you and be transformed forevermore. For the sake of Christ and crown we ask it. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands true forever. Amen. Please be seated. The context of the epistle, Paul's epistle to Timothy, can be found in chapter 3 and verse 15. We read these words. If I delay... You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. That's the context in which Paul writes to young Timothy. And it's the context in which he charges Timothy with these instructions here throughout the epistle as he has written them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's instruction provided so that people will know how to conduct themselves in God's household, which, as Paul writes, is nothing other than the church of the living God. These instructions on practical matters are of primary importance. Let me say that again. These instructions on practical matters are of primary importance and certainly as we come to the matter of leadership within the context of the local church. Now all of us, I am sure, are aware of the importance of leadership. 
The church of Jesus Christ does not progress beyond its spiritual, its spiritual progress of its leaders. And that's why the New Testament has a tremendous amount to say about the vital nature of leadership within the church. And it describes the role and function of leadership, the authority which attaches itself to leadership, which is derived from none other than Christ himself, and is mediated through the proclamation of his word. And then the characteristics which are to be represented in the lives of those who are entrusted with the responsibility of leadership. In the unfolding pattern of Acts, we see this over and over again, don't we? The Acts of the Apostles proclaimed the good news of the gospel and people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Then they congregated in fellowships of God's people devoting themselves to what? The Apostles' doctrine, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. We see leadership within the church, especially the office of elder, established early on in the missionary journeys. This is not uncommon. And we see this throughout Acts. And then we're told in Acts as well that these apostles return to these fellowships to ensure that everything is running smoothly, running decently and in the order like good Presbyterians, even back in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So the importance of leadership within the church is established rather quickly, isn't it? Both in the Old Covenant as well as the New, but we see the church develop as is it, we are instructed in the New Testament rather clearly. Some are called, as you know, to be responsible for the leadership of others, while all are to be responsible to the leadership of Jesus through his word. Now that's the principle that really should be stated and restated over and over again in the church. We all, hear me now, we all are responsible to the leadership of Jesus. When it comes to the church, the body of believers corporately gathered under the headship of Christ himself we collectively are all called to be responsible to Christ Jesus. Even the leadership that has been set aside by the laying on the ha of hands and chosen out from among the congregation, they too are first and foremost responsible to the headship and leadership of Christ. That's an important principle that's often overlooked, especially when we talk about ordination and installation of elders. That we collectively, this is your charge, congregation, we collectively are all responsible to the leadership of Christ. As a body here united, under Christ Jesus, here at Reedville Presbyterian Church, we all have a tremendous responsibility. And I ask, are you responsible? to the leadership of Christ? Are you, as a member of this body, first and foremost, responsible to the headship, the leadership of Christ Jesus? That's the principle that's established, and it's the one that ought to be stated and restated, and often it's not. That this is a collective thing. This isn't just for those men. Just for the husband at home over his household. Just for this particular person and that particular person in those particular situations. It's for the bride of Christ to be held accountable and remain responsible to the leadership of Christ. And we need to remember that while a man may be responsible for the leadership of his home, as I said, as he exercises that spiritual priesthood that all men have been given according to God's word, 
It's even more so here in the body of believers gathered, the church of Jesus Christ. So, congregation, I charge you first and foremost this morning. Are you responsible to the leadership of Christ? Or do you have your own plans? Are you making your own decisions? Are you doing your own thing, you know, and merely gathering on Sunday mornings just to be part of the body, but you don't submit to Christ in crown? See, church is for more than Sunday morning. It's for life. The leadership of Christ and our responsibility to be obedient to his headship is a way of life. It's not something we can do and not do. How many of you as parents, when your kids were growing up and they were troubled, now this congregation can't lie to me because I know a lot of your children, had trouble with your children being obedient. And you kept saying, why won't you listen to me? One of our favorite sayings in our household was, you listen with your ears, not your mouth. You shouldn't be talking while I'm talking to you, especially about this subject. Any of you had children like that that were real defensive, you would say, hey, so and so. And immediately they had some great story and excuse going on. Have you ever stopped to consider what God might feel like with us? As he's the head of the church itself, as he the one that leads and guides and directs us? And we always have our own ideas, our own agendas. We should do it this way, God. I should be able to do this, and I should be able to do that. And I wonder how many, God, how many times God said, and I know that this isn't theologically uh, sound, but I, how, many, how many times does God say, Oh, man, you listen with your ears, son, not your mouth. Kind of like, our Old Testament reading. Be careful what you ask for. God might give you enough of it to choke on it. A rather scary text. Did we just start that? Okay. Think about that. That's my charge to you this morning. Are you, as the body of believers, responsible to the leadership of Christ? in the church. And then as we are all aware that here Paul is addressing certain individuals that have been called out from among others who are under the leadership of Christ to lead God's people, to be leaders of others who are being led by the same shepherd, if you will. And he sets these men apart and we see why character is so significant, so paramount when it comes to leadership. Men who are called to be leaders in the church are to be a certain quality, a certain kind of men. It's not that the qualities are different, mind you, from the qualities that you are to be that are to be discovered and seen in your own individual lives. That's another misconception I want, I want to dispel right here. Men, these qualities are qualities you're to possess as well as members of the church of Jesus Christ. These aren't special qualities or characteristics just merely assigned to people who are called to the office of elder in the church. They're for every Christian, men and women. And far too often we look at them and, and our first uh, reaction to the, the list of characteristics is, well, nobody can fulfill that list, right? Or we all fall short on that list. Or it's a good thing that I don't have to be perfect, but that's not what Paul says here, really. The older I get, the more I condemn by this passage, quite frankly. Paul says these are characteristics that we're supposed to possess before, before, mind you, we are called into leadership. 
And there are characteristics that each one of us are called to possess in our own personal lives. Now, that's what's going on here in this text. I hope you didn't come this morning thinking you were going to get a 10-minute real quick sermon. We're going to lay on some hands and we're going to head down the road. This is a very... My problem is I'm tied to this church. I'm emotionally tied to this church. And this is a pivotal point in the life of this church. Amen. So this won't be a quick thing. This is a very sacred and solemn occasion in the life of the church in general. It's a very strategic time in the life of this church that should be taken as a solemn and sacred occasion. We were talking about history on the way in here, uh, Mr. Hayes and myself a little bit. This is a pivotal moment in the life of Reedville for the history of the church and the continuation of the church into the future as the kingdom unfolds. This is a very solemn occasion, I believe. And it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor for you to be here and to be part of that. That God, by His grace, has brought you here. And that's a sermon within itself. So I'll quit. But I haven't changed much. I preach six sermons all at one time. Especially when my mind's working. We're talking about leadership. And we've already made the assertion that a church is only as godly as its leaders. And the character... The characteristics listed here in Timothy are not just characteristics for those set aside to the office, but for every Christian to aspire to and to entertain and to cultivate in their own individual lives. And our prayer is, as we've examined thoroughly and instructed the candidate the elder elect, that he already possesses these qualities. That it's not something he's going to grow into. It's not like a job. Well, you can start here, and maybe by the end of it, you can be running the whole company, right? If you learn, you know, start with a broom, and you can end up in the BPC. No, no, no. These qualities and characteristics are something we pray he already possesses, and I pray you already have obtained. You follow me here? That's rather significant. So I want to unpack this just a little bit. I want to look at the, 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 the context of the whole thing, and I've shown you the context of the, the specific text that we're considering in, in Timothy 1. Uh, Three, or, yeah, Timothy 1, 1 through 3, 1 through 7, excuse me. But I just want to talk quickly about the context here, a little bit about what's happening, the call itself, and just something about the characteristics that really all unfold and unravel under one statement Paul makes to Timothy. But first, let me say this again. The character and effectiveness of any church is directly related to its leadership. The character and effectiveness of any church is directly related to its leadership. That's why the Bible emphasizes, as I've already stated, the significance of qualified church leadership. And the problem is a failure to hold to those standards. That's what has led to so many problems within the church itself today. Often a church that is failing to have an impact on the world will look to new programs, better music, or an improved facility, all of which Wish that thing wasn't on so I could preach to my own people. All of which we all know we have tried. Right? 
a church that is often failing to be effective looks to outside things, programs, music. The sad thing is, is the last thing we look at is leadership. And it's often why a church is not effective. The best sermon preached is one preached to yourself first. That was the problem Timothy faced in Ephesus. That's why Paul gave him a detailed explanation of the qualifications of the elders in, here in 1 Timothy. You see, the Ephesian Christians were well acquainted with high-quality leaders. Several years prior to writing 1 Timothy, Paul had started the church at Ephesus and had spent three years there. Three years there training a group of godly men to serve as elders. You can read about this in Acts 18 and Acts 20. Those men had a deep love for the Lord and for the word and for Paul. And at that time, the Ephesian church was a strategic church with solid leadership. If you look in Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, you'll note what the last thing Paul says to the Ephesian elders was this. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw you away, to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, 29, in verse 30. The last thing Paul says to the church at Ephesus. See, Paul knew that Satan would attack, the world would conspire, and the flesh would rear its ugly head. And that false leaders would emerge teaching lies and heresy within the church. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And upon returning to Ephesus, after, I, I believe, his first uh, Roman imprisonment, Paul decided to leave Timothy here, there, to take care of the situation, if you will, while he traveled on to Macedonia. And he's not gone long before he writes back to Timothy with these instructions regarding several issues in the Ephesian church. He noted, I believe, Paul notes a handful of things. He noted that some were not qualified to be elders. He noted that some departed from God's word. He noted that some were women. Were women. Now, I don't want to lecture on Women officers in the church, the Bible's clear. He noted that some were apostates. Listen to what I'm saying. Taken right from Paul's epistle here in 1 Timothy. He saw that some weren't qualified. Some departed from God's word. Some were women. Some were apostates. They'd rejected the faith. And also, he noted some were mistreating the elderly. Something important for the Apostle Paul. That's the setting in which this letter is written. And often it's presented as in a form like this, so proper and so precise and so decently in the world, right? And yet in reality, Paul wrote this after he had returned to the church and had seen how far the leadership had drifted. And he tells Timothy, you stay here and clean this mess up. Here's what I've noticed. I noticed some of these men aren't qualified. They need to go. Some of these individuals have left, departed from God's word. Some aren't even supposed to be leaders. Some have rejected Christ himself. They're apostates. Uh, apostate, excuse me. 
And you know what? They're not treating God's people properly as they should. Timothy, clean it up. And fan into flame the gift that God has given you. That's the context. Now, secondly, I want you to understand, and this is for the one who will be ordained and installed. This is a serious call. Paul writes in verse 1, the saying is trustworthy. Five times he uses that. And really what Paul's saying is, this is true. Listen up. And basically he's almost saying, and, and our uh, academic friends would not appreciate this, but this is actually true. What Paul is saying here is, guys, no kidding. Right? This is the way it's supposed to be. This is a true saying. Listen to it. Kind of like, duh. <laughs> right? This is a serious, serious call on your life. It's a, it's a sacred trust, if you will. It's a difficult task. It's a task given to you with much difficulty and yet sacred in the eyes of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he leads you to lead others. It will come with pain. It will come with disappointment. It will come with rejection. It will come with suffering, loss, heartache. It comes with all those things. And yet, it's a call of sacrificial service to Christ. And brother, may there be no greater joy that you ever taste than to truly, sacrificially serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's a sacred trust to hold office in the church. It's a difficult task for sure. And it's a strategic task. Church leaders have always been strategic people. That's what makes it difficult to separate the flesh and the world and our own, uh, uh, and the evil one himself. We're always, we're strategic people, aren't we? And yet we only carry our flesh into office with us. And we think, oh, I don't see why God wouldn't like this idea. <laughs> right? Well, it's not his idea. And we struggle with that. But we're, we're strategic people by nature. But that's why it's so important, so important to be called by God. And qualified first to serve. To know that that will rear its ugly head in you. I'm not serving you. You serve me. I've given hours and hours and hours to you people. You stiff-necked people. You want meat? I'll give you meat. Right? You hard-headed, hard-necked people. You sure you want that? And we think, well, we should do it this way. Be mindful of the one who struck the rock. For you will be judged more than they. Be strategic, but make sure you're walking in the strategy, if you will, of the desire of God and not the desires of your own heart. That's the call. The characteristics, in conclusion, our last topic, if you will. Saying is trustworthy, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Duh. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Everything from here kind of unfolds and unravels. Okay? Or, better yet, stated, explains or builds on that very statement. You see, 
The prayer is, is that we enter the office above reproach. That we come and we're recognized because we are above reproach. That no man will pick necessarily his finger and point his finger at you and say, but Roy, but Roy. That's hard in the world we live in when everything's on a cell phone, isn't it? It's hard in a world we live in when everybody wants to do what? Discredit. Hear me. Discredit anything that has to do with the church. Isn't it? It's a hard thing. But yet we above all else are to be above reproach. That is, even if we be charged, it can't stick. It won't stick. It doesn't stick. We're talking about character, a man's inner soul. And quite frankly, God knows a man's inner soul better than the man himself. And we misjudge people all the time, don't we? You think people are better than they are? And we find out they're not. We think people aren't that good and we find out, wow. Missed that one. If you model all the leaders, including myself, if we model our leader, Christ Jesus, we will be above reproach. Now hear me, that just doesn't mean on Sunday mornings, session meetings in a presbytery. That means when life gets messy and real and you're in the parking lot after a session meeting. Or someone at church absolutely annoys you and discredits you. I charge you to be above reproach. A difficult task. A sacred call. But one that will be accomplished if Christ leads you. So in essence, what Paul is telling Timothy is go find people that love Jesus again, will you? Find people that love Jesus. And are above reproach in their love for him and others. See, your job is not just to love Jesus. Your job is to love the flock. And we are lovable. But you're to love them anyway. So I charge you, Mr. Verbs, may you see the weight of the call in your life. May you first, listen, may you first guard your own heart and your own relationship with the Lord. Then you make sure you lead your household well. Hear me. Then you tend to the flock. Because if you fail at the first two, you'll fail at the third one. And you know what? God himself, through a harsh providence, your flesh, the world itself, and even the devil will seek to discredit it all the time. Because the last thing any of those things wants is godly leaders in the church. Why? Why is it the last thing? 
the world, your ugly flesh, and the evil one himself wants, because the church is only as godly as its leaders. May God grant us all the grace necessary to lead well. And when we fall short, be the first to confess and return. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for taking broken people like us. Poor leaders as we are. And call us to come out to lead others. Father, we confess that we've fallen short. And we pray for your spirit to be in abundance upon us in order that we would rightly lead those you've entrusted into our care. We understand this office to be a spiritual one. We understand our authority to be spiritual and in Christ himself. But Lord, it is the most powerful force in all of creation. Grant that we would have faith to lead under that power. The headship of Christ. Trusting in your sovereign decree of all things. Your providential working in our lives. And the hope that is ours that all things work together for your glory and our good. Again, grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to believe that Christ is the head of the church. We ask this in his name alone. Amen. Mr. Barrett, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament as originally given to be the inerrant word of God the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Yes, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your session the change which has taken place in your view since the assumption of this ordination vow. Yes, I do. Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America? I, do. I very much approve. Of it. Is it in a, is it in a conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? Yes, I do. That's the important part. Do you accept the office of ruling elder? in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer. Do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? Yes, I do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, and unity and edification of the church? Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive this brother as a ruling elder? And do you promise to yield him all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles him? Do you? I'll ask the session to join me as we pray and lay hands on Roy and set him apart.
to the sacred office in which he's been called. Would you kneel? Huddle up. Would any of you like to pray? Or would any of you like to pray or no? I should have asked this earlier. Okay. And then I'll close it. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, O Lord, for his devotion, for his faith in you, for his leadership in this church, for the example that he sets for all of us. We thank you for that. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory for everything that's accomplished in his life and ours. In Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this man here that you have brought us to undertake this office of being an elder. Our Father, he's more than an elder to us. He's a friend. He's a husband. He's a father. He's a keeper. Our Father, we just bless you and we just ask that you bless everything that he does and he touches and he says. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Dear Father, we do. Continuing this time of prayer, I just thank you for the gentleman that you have sent to us, as I've said when we first met and realized his faith, his family, and those around him, and all how he his devotion to you. That Lord, you had sent him here, and sent him here for a reason, and I think this is part of the reason in praying for that. The Lord, we just thank you for the uh, for Roy, his family, lift them up, use them in a mighty way in our church. The community, as far as our church is concerned, this is part of our future of this church and leadership. We ask us in Jesus' name. Oh, Father and God, we ask that you put a hedge of protection around this man. That you would watch over him closely. That you would walk with him. That he would walk with you day and night. Father, grant him your spirit in such a way that he would be bold for the sake of Christ and crown. That he would stand firm upon your word. Quickly to share, qualified and able to defend the truth that has been revealed to him. Father, may that truth grow in his own heart. May it grow in his own life and may he lead well for the sake of Christ. It's in his name we ask all these things. Amen. Being properly ordained and installed as a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church of America, I give you the right hand of fellowship, brother. Welcome. Take your brother's hands. I now pronounce and declare that Roy Burps has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a ruling elder in this church, agreeable to the word of God, and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such he is entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.